Hi, I'm Cheryl Spaulding, and I'm president of Mainstream, and I want to welcome all of you, including our guest speakers here tonight. And for those of you visiting us for the first time, and I seem to see a lot of new faces, uh, I want to let you know a little bit about Mainstream. It's a civic organization committed to educating the public about the, uh, what's going on in Topeka, particularly the politics. And after hearing our speakers tonight, I hope that each of you will become ambassadors of truth and information. And uh, let your neighbors, friends, and family know what you've learned. Because too often, people don't bother to vote simply because they don't know the issues and they don't know the players. So I want you to pay attention. I want you to become ambassadors and people who know what's going on so you can talk. We can't do it just for the few people that are up here, everybody has to do that, has to be involved. Besides educating the public, we support those Republicans, Democrats, and independents who believe that compromise is necessary to run a democracy and is not a cop-out. We don't all agree on every issue here in mainstream because we are Republicans, Democrats, and independents. But we do agree on a number of things, including supporting our schools and an independent judiciary, among them, <coughs> several other things. And now, yes. Yeah. Thank you. And now for the introductions. I'm very happy to be able to introduce these two gentlemen. Dr. Burnett Loomis, chair to my left, is a professor of political science at the University of Kansas. His areas of interest include American politics, Congress, interest groups, and state legislatures. Recently published the ninth edition of his co-edited Interest Group Politics, including his articles, The Tea Party is an Interest Movement, right? Uh, group Brand, Out of Action. Oh, it's a faction, okay. <laughs> and he also oversees an oral history project for veteran Kansas state legislators. Uh, Dr. Michael Smith is an associate professor of political science at Emporia State University. He describes himself as passionate about connecting my teaching to politics to the real world. Dr. Smith is interested in voter-approved term limits and their impact on state legislators, legislatures, as well as working on political campaigns. So let's give them a uh, warm welcome. Okay, thank you both for joining us, and I'm going to let you each talk about what you know about politics and what's coming up in this 2016 legislature, and then we're going to have people write questions from the audience, and people will bring them up, and you can answer questions, so how about it? Usually I end up going, try to go last so I can clean up everything, but uh, let, me go, let me go first today. Uh, uh, first of all, I'm on, on the back end of a, of a cold, and so I may sound a little cackly, uh, but I actually feel pretty good, and I better feel good because I'm flying to Chicago first thing in the morning. Uh, okay, uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me once again. Uh, it seems to me that either you really didn't like what we did the last time or you have very short memories. And getting, getting older, the second seems, you know, at least as, as, as probable as the first. Um, and I see lots of old friends, uh, former state legislators, Facebook friends, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, You know, I, I, I was reminded we were here about a year ago, and probably relatively more optimistic uh, than I uh, that. I'll be to, uh, tonight, although um, uh, I, I do see, honestly, some, some, some glimmers of hope. Uh, 
uh, mostly because things have gotten so bad. In the famous words of Richard and Mimi Farina, uh, Mimi Farina is Joan Baez's sister, uh, been, so, been down so long, looks like up to me. Uh, so, uh, without further ado, I think Michael can either, uh, you know, chime in with, with, with uh, uh, joining me on, on some of these themes and adding some of, of, of his own. Uh, it strikes me that uh, the thing to watch in, in 2016, during the session, I think there's other things to watch in terms of the politics of 2016, the primaries in November, but the session itself, uh, the, the question is, Will very conservative but not crazy Republicans uh, move ahead uh, on reality based uh, legislation? Uh, and I was beginning to see some, some signs of this. Uh, no one would mistake uh, Jim Denning as uh, uh, a moderate of, of any sort. I mean, he's a very conservative Republican. Uh, but he's an accountant, he's a, he was a CEO, uh, he can read a balance sheet, and he looks at the Kansas balance sheet and doesn't like uh, what, he, what he sees, and is willing to address the issue of taxes. And I think particularly the first item there is going to be the 330,000 independent businesses that have, have gone scot-free with no economic gain uh, at all. As, a, as someone who owns, has uh, part owner of three businesses and owns rental property, I'd like to thank the governor. Uh, uh, but I'd really rather pay the taxes, to tell you the truth. So I think that in that ba in that basis, and, and the other person, and I just wrote about this this last week, uh, is Jeff King from Independence. His, uh, the hospital in his hometown is being closed, um, and he can see uh, for whatever reason, the hospital being closed, uh, that he, I think he has, obviously has ambitions, a young, smart guy. Um, uh, maybe we can find a way, like Indiana, which they're just at here in, in Cleveland, to do Medicaid somehow. Um, so I think taxes is number one. Medicaid expansion is, is, is really number two. Uh, with three is K, is K, K uh, through 12 uh, funding. I honestly don't think the courts are going to get further attacked this year. I could be wrong because they hate the courts. I mean, they, the, the right wing majorities on both sides and the government. Um, but we'll have to see how this crazy legislation comes out in terms of uh, whether or not, uh, if, you, if uh, the courts decide in a certain way, funding can be taken away from them. That's never happened in any state. That is a gross violation of separation of powers. Uh, so we'll see on that. Uh, but I do think what Brownback, Far Right, the Kochs, et cetera, see is five judicial retention elections coming up in the fall. And I think they believe that they can win all five of those. They came very close in 2014. Had the election been two weeks later, um, I think uh, the, the, the two uh, ju uh, justices would have been uh, would have been defeated. Uh, so uh, I think I think they see that as the, as the way to get control of the judicial branch. They don't need a, a constitutional amendment. Uh, they I think they think they can do it via uh, re re retention. So. Um, the one other thing I would say, I'm looking a little past the uh, legislative session, is that the most crucial thing for you to be doing, come, I'd say two things. The next time you guys come, you know, it's nice to see that there's new faces. The next time you come, bring someone under 40. <laughs> I'm serious. I was going to say I'm serious with a heart attack. In this crowd, not a good thing. <laughs> Is that a good metaphor? But I'm, I'm really serious. That, uh, that's number one. And number two, uh, 
if there's going to be change in Kansas in 2016, uh, and I think there's the potential for change, there has to be really good moderate candidates, Democratic or Republican. The independent thing didn't work so well the last time. Uh, Greg Orman, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and, and you may well support it, but I, I think that you really do need the party label, either in a primary or in the general election. But, uh, but boy, recruiting good candidates, uh, 15 or 20 uh, statewide, maybe 25, 30, uh, certainly a fair number in this area. Uh, uh, Johnson County has a fifth of the House seats, a fifth of the Senate seats. Uh, recruiting good candidates is the most important thing that, that, that you, can, you can possibly do. Because without good candidates, uh, you, you simply can't win these very, very difficult uh, elections. With that, I'll turn it over to Michael. <clears throat> Um, I was thinking over what to say to you tonight that you don't already know. Okay. You're a pretty plugged in group. But, um, and uh, it occurred to me that uh, the theme of my comments that I want to pass on is, uh, with, re with regards to your question, what to expect in 2016. I think 2016 may be the year when the, um, when the stuff gets real, to slightly modify a popular catch. <laughs> Uh, and what I mean by that is, <laughs> you, you, you get it, um, <clears throat> even though you're over 40. Um, uh, what I mean is this, um, there have been all these fee fund sweeps uh, to try to plug the budget hole. There have been changes in the tax code. Um, there have been stuff about the courts, the school-based funding formula is gone. Um, but remember that, uh, all of us in this room are very, very strange people. Uh, we are the outlier because we care about politics. We follow politics. We vote in elections when most people don't, midterms, primaries, local elections. Um, most people don't. Uh, most people, if they vote, it's once every four years in the presidential election. Uh, and I, particularly for people that do not work for state government, I don't know how many Kansans have really noticed that their everyday lives have changed as a result of everything. The schools are still open. My kids are in school in Kansas. The class is still open. I still have a job. Um, the traffic still moves on I-435. Wow. They're still doing construction on that big interchange. <laughs> they will be for a while. There must be some money somewhere because they're still working on it. Um, things are, the state government appears at the surface to still be functioning. And so when I say that in 2016, and really fiscal year 2017, might be when the stuff gets real, is that that's when we're gonna start to feel the pinch. One group I know of, state employees are kind of a special case, because we're in it. Um, but one group I know of that has already felt the pinch is, is people with relatives that have developmental disabilities. That privatization of uh, Medicaid has, has come home. Um, and its services are changing and, and not surprisingly, most of the people I've heard from say they're worse, and they're very concerned about their loved ones who receive assistance from the state with this capitated approach to Medicaid and so on and so forth. So that would be one group for whom this stuff's already come home. But what about everybody else? Um, schools are still open. Um, you know, traffic's still flowing. I think in 2016, as we get into FY 2017, one of these days, we're going to start seeing the highway projects get canceled because there's no. Um, I think they'll finish up projects, including I-35, I-435, K-10. They'll finish projects like that. They won't start new ones. Um, they'll move into just a maintenance mode. Uh, we can put down that coat of asphalt, but we can't do new projects. Um, I think in the schools, what I predict is the thing that's going to hit first is not funding, it's morale. Um, and you've seen the studies, I'm sure. but. Uh, Teachers are taking early retirement at a higher rate, um, and students are moving away from the education major or looking at jobs in other states, not so much because it's gotten so bad that school districts can't pay them, but because their morale is so bad, they just don't want to do it this anymore. There's tremendous uncertainty about where we are on school funding. They don't know if they'll have a job five or ten years from now. Um, and there's the, uh, the removal of the due process. 
Um, and then there's just, I think, just, just other morale issues. And you've got, you know, there was a state senator uh, quoted on the radio yesterday, apparently not meaning it as a joke. It said, we are spending too much money on schools in this state. We need to spend more of that on prisons. Oh. <laughs> I'm not making this up. <laughs> you heard it too. Uh, it's not and uh, the morale is just so beaten down. So I'm not saying that the schools are just a wash in mud. I'm not one of the people that's going to tell you that. Uh, but I think before the school funding thing hits home, the morale thing's going to get home. Get, get home. And the kids are going to lose their teachers because they're going to take early retirement. They're going to be looking at private schools. They're going to be looking at other states. And, of course, I teach at a school at Emporia that's known for producing teachers. And we do have kids looking at changing their majors or asking about, you know, how do I get credentials to teach in other states? Um, and so that would be another example of what I mean. It's, gonna, it's got to come home. People have to feel it. Uh, people have to say, you know, we've been waiting for that two-lane road in our little town to be a four-lane road years we just found out it's camp um, or what happened to my kids favorite teacher um, and no one will take the job now that was vacated in the person took early retirement what what's going on here and of course teachers do that anyway but the numbers are up the, the numbers are up it's not an aberration um, and um, then I wanted to address politics just very briefly um, it seems to me, I'd be interested in not only your opinion, Bird, but everybody's opinion, but it seems to me that Paul Davis is still the guy to watch on the Democrat side. He seems to have the best name recognition right now among Kansas Democrats. He didn't go away. Um, and so what I'm going to be watching for there is, I mean, look, this is a red state. Kansas is not going to be voting in the general election for Hillary Clinton or Bernie Sanders. Uh, maybe in the caucuses, but not in the general election. Uh, and so the issue is going to be with Obama moving out of the picture, and he has been such a lightning rod. Can will we see a return to the days when Democrats and local races can differentiate themselves from the National Democratic Party? Will we? And let's just say it's Hillary Clinton. Um, I'm not. That's not a prediction. It's for the sake of argument. Will. Will, if Hillary's the nominee, will say a Paul Davis be able to say, don't worry about Hillary Clinton, I'm Paul Davis, and I want to restore funding to your local schools and do something about these high sales taxes. I'm not worried about Hillary Clinton, I'm worried about Kansas. Um, those messages used to work. In this, uh, in modern era, this state's had nearly as many years of Democratic governors as Republican ones. But there seems to be something about Obama as president that, that wasn't working. Is that an aberration? Do we return to the norm, or is that a permanent shift? And, and uh, I'm supposed to tell you what to watch for in 2016, but honestly, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I just want to add on to uh, uh, Michael's stuff on uh, the, the pothole theory of, of governance. Um, one of my good friends is uh, Deb Miller, uh, former uh, uh, KDOT uh, secretary for eight years under uh, uh, Kathleen Sebelius and, and Mark Parkinson. And even the first year of the Brownback administration, they kept her on. She thought she could do good. Uh, she finally just said, I can't take this anymore. Um, but she's now in DC with the Surface Transportation Board, very, very savvy. And her analysis is that uh, the money on state projects, not, and I think 495 is, 435 is probably federal money. But state projects, they will finish the projects that are currently going on. Um, they have no money for new projects. And her analysis is they really do not have money, even for maintenance or any kind of, anything that comes close to adequate maintenance. Uh, they have swept that, those funds. And, and all administrations have used the bank of KDOT. Kathleen Sebelius did it, John Carlin did it, Bill Graves did it. Everybody has done that to an extent. But what uh, the Brownback administration has done uh, in particular is to borrow money on uh, uh, in bonding and then take that money and use it for general uh, operations. So Kansas is not supposed to be able to go into debt. We're supposed to allegedly have a balanced budget. Uh, but that's simply one step removed. That's essentially uh, 
uh, not a balanced, a balanced budget. So, um, Deb, I trust Deb on transportation tremendously, and uh, when she talked about that, it was it was really uh, striking. That I mean, she wasn't this wasn't an opinion. This was you know you know well well grounded. Uh, the other thing I'd like to say before I hand the mic back is I really want to thank you for the wine tonight. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if you uh, would like to ask a question, there are people on the sides who have um, uh, cards that you can write your questions on. So please, you know, kind of raise your hand or wave at them and, and uh, get your card either passed to them or ask for a card or whatever. And uh, we'll, we'll uh, try to ask those questions. I've got one. Um, Based on what all all the uh, predictions are, well, all the actual money that's going to we're going to be underwater. Where where do you think the money is either going to come from, or what do you predict is going to happen next for this coming year? And they supposedly did a two year budget, so they don't have to deal with it. But we're going to be underwater. What do you predict that they're going to do? What are the options that they can do? I mean, they can't borrow from the bank, it's paid on. They've swept the fees. So to balance the budget, well, what's he going to do? What, what is Brownback obligated to do? What's the legislature obligated to do? <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm not particularly confident in my answer. Um, uh, my, I view Brownback as being just in complete denial. I'm just not even acknowledging that there is a problem. Um, you know, it, it's I, I harangue my poor students that budgeting is not equal portions of money. 10% you know, for schools, 10% for residents. There are certain big dogs that dominate the state budget. Uh, same thing in the federal budget. But at the state level, um, it's it's Medicaid and then school-based funding for uh, Those are these great big huge wedges of the pie chart and then everything else is a smaller sliver. Um, they've already privatized Medicaid. Um, there have been some problems there. I'm not an expert in that area, but, but from what I do, it's, it's rocky. Um, so, and they've done away with the school-based funding for um, Now, this block grant thing was supposed to be temporary. 2016 is an election year. Typically, we don't make policy in election year. We run for re-election. And so did they just renew the block grant and push it back to 2017? Um, there is, uh, I was studying the Missouri school-based funding formula. That was passed um, by a Republican General Assembly, signed when Matt Blunt was governor. And there's a concept in there that I imagine that um, Alec likes very much, called adequacy. Um, and, and there's this idea, which I think Alec, Alec uh, actively supports, that that moving away from equity, moving away from trying to equalize funding among school districts, we set a minimum based on what are benchmarks as high performing school districts. Say, well, if they can do it for that much money, that's the formula. And the other thing that's interesting about Missouri's formula, I learned, is they have far fewer weights. The old Kansas formula, which is gone now, but it had this riot of weights, and that's why everybody complained, including the governor himself, oh, it's so complicated, you can't understand it. Uh, Missouri has like five weights, and that's a pre reduced and a couple other things, and they don't even kick in. Um, so my best guess, long term, if they're around to make policy long term, we'll see, um, is that they're going to look at that school-based funding point. Um, and realistically, um, I'd have to agree with our colleague Ed Flinch, um, they're going to throw it back on the local, local policy plan, I think, in the communities that can afford it, which would include here. Um, but that still doesn't answer your question about 2016. I don't know what kind of sorcery you do. To get through 2016 and on the sales tax exemption thing um, my understanding I mean you're not gonna get a lot of money off Girl Scout uh, my understanding is that the big dog on the sales tax exemption thing is uh, farm equipment you're gonna take away the farm equipment exemption in a farm state for a $200,000 combine or whatever those things cost. Um, I don't I wouldn't do that in an election year would you um, so so the answer to your question, long term, I think they're going to be looking at this adequacy business with school funding. Short term, I have no idea. Well, 
Okay, I, I can do short terms. Um, <laughs> you, you got the you got the chair of the House Appropriations Committee saying you're going to come into a hundred million dollar deficit. They get Ron Reichman, no no moderate at, at all, but apparently you count. Uh, <laughs> that's a plus. I <laughs> um, you know, I I I think that uh, Mike was absolutely right that there is denial. I had a uh, a friend of mine. I'm making holy stories tonight. A friend of mine who started the Free State Brewery, Chuck Magrel over in uh, Lawrence. God bless Chuck. Uh, and so. Uh, he's, he is part of uh, uh, Leadership Kansas, and, which is run in large part by the State Chamber of Commerce. And so he was over in Topeka, and they had uh, uh, the, 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 Rev the Revenue Secretary, Nick Jordan, Simon from the Chamber, and then Anthony Hensley, um, uh, the Democratic leader in the Senate. Uh, he didn't mention what Anthony said. I can only imagine. But uh, here was Nick Jordan just saying, oh, you know, we don't really, things are, things are not that bad. And, uh, and blah, blah, blah. And, and, and Chuck is certainly no liberal, uh, kind of libertarian-ish. Um, but he finally said, uh, oh, look, I sent tax revenues to camp to, to Topeka twice a month, da, 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 da. And you say you can't explain why sales tax revenues are going down. Um, what's the story here? And, and yeah, basically, uh, they, there, there was no explanation aside from the fact that the, this is just a temporary glitch. Well, we've had temporary glitch after temporary, you know, on and on. I've heard that story before. But I, I think what it brought home was that even, you know, it was leadership Kansas. These aren't stupid people at all. And they're just they're simply still willing to be in denial, willing willing to blow the smoke. Uh, and and that to me was very depressing. That they aren't doing what Jim Denning or Reichman is doing and, and, and looking it square square in in the face. I and then Obama uh, then Obama got brown back. <laughs> uh, brown brown back says, Well, you know, I'm not gonna worry about taxes or cuts. You know, we'll get through this. And I'm like, again, what world? Uh, so I do I do think what I see is a lot of the the very, very conservative but not crazy legislators looking at this and saying, Okay, our bond ratings are going down. Um, we may be able to fund schools adequately right now, but that's gonna be problematic. Um, and if they have a brain, that's a big if, uh, they also understand, and this is really hard to tell a story, that they've hollowed out the bureaucracy. There are so many mid-level people who have gone. It, it, and so there's a whole question, not just of ideology, but of competence. Uh, and you see that on the budgeting side. Uh, I don't know how many of you know Nick Jordan, but do you want him to Deciding tax revenues, I don't. Uh, uh, and and I, I think that I, I think that um, Mike was absolutely right that there have to be the stories, the disaster. I mean, a disaster in uh, in, in some kind of uh, Medicaid uh, disability, disability. You know, funny where where someone goes. You know, uh, as a terrible. Uh, Example, and I see Finn right there, and, and you know, and I, I understand. In the, but 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 that's it. You have to bring it, make it make it more more personal. In the end, there are going to be allotments. I think. I think the governor uh, will cut more uh, in in the in traditional Willie Sutton sense. He will go where the money is, uh, and that's K K through twelve ed education. Uh, I don't see how. It, it, you're not going there sooner or later because that's that's where the, where the where the where the money is. Um, but uh, I, I think that again, Michael was absolutely right. The, the, the games you can play, the sweeps, everything. Um, 
there's always another trick to be played, but um, you have this decline in revenues. Uh, that, and we all talk about the decline in revenues relative to um, the uh, uh, estimates. Uh, and, that's, and that's very important because the estimates keep going down, you know, they keep going down. So year to year, it's far, and, and, and the final thing I say is that there should be a, a tremendous wake, wake up call is that sales tax revenues have gone. And you raise the sales tax, and sales tax revenues are going down. If I lived here, I'd go to, to, to shop for groceries. Uh, I, I, and, and the other, uh, but the final thing there is, and I think you can do some work here in terms of campaigning. What, whatever the local sales tax is in, in Lawrence, it's 9.05. 9.05 on groceries uh, is immoral. And so you can talk about the, the, the dollars and cents, but you can also talk about the morality of, of taking almost 10% of some, someone on the borderline uh, income uh, spending uh, and for taxation on food. Okay. Um, you talked about uh, a number of things that we have here. Uh, one of them I read recently in the newspaper, and it's a question here too, that it says if we have 40 vacancies in the prison system, how do we keep sending more people to prison without raising funding? And I guess my question to you is, do you see any reforms where they might let people out because they're in for marijuana or some other minor, more minor issue? Do you think you see that as part of the solution that they might come up with or not? I'll just answer very quickly. Uh, yes, I do. Uh, I, I think that this is something that happened now. I haven't followed this as much in Kansas and other places, but certainly at the federal level and in many other states, and, and states like Texas, uh, that you have a situation in which uh, very conservative legislators have seen that uh, uh, they can save money uh, in, in this way. And, and we have gone way too far in incarcerating people for long periods of time. So I think that overall, nationally, that trend exists. I think that it, that it also exists in Kansas. And if I were in the legislature and I was, and I was quite conservative, uh, there's this proposal to expand prison in El Dorado. I would, I would take that off the, 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 the table in a second and say, if we can't find four or five hundred people to let go earlier, we're not really trying at, 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 at all. Just want to throw in uh, the uh, um, the Koch brothers and even Koch Industries taking the stand of being opposed to putting nonviolent offenders in prison, which is entirely consistent with their libertarian ideology. That, that that's if, if something is the abuse of big government putting a lot of uh, people convicted of nonviolent offenses in prison would be a good example, and it costs a lot of our and their taxpayer dollars. Um, and uh, that could really provide some cover for some conservatives um, that you've got these this uh, these very outspoken conservative activists funding research indicating that it would be a good idea to to um, move away from incarcerating um, nonviolent offenders so uh, I'm, I'm gonna say yes I think we may indeed see that the next one is I don't know been paying attention uh, in Colorado there were some school board members uh, that the Koch brothers funded spent a lot of money to try to get them elected and it didn't work uh, both of you guys are plugged into the systems here have you seen that go on here do you think that's something that is ongoing uh, here do you think it's going to be uh, uh, something that we can see continue here or um, tell us what you think Without any question, uh, in, in how often the Cokes will come into the conversation here, but they certainly have had uh, a more, more increasing interest in local politics, without, without a doubt. Uh, I think the, 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 the Kansas case here that you really want to watch is Wichita. Uh, 
where you have the county board that, that they have very, very conservative. I mean, okay. I hate using the word conservative to talk to about far part of the right people. Uh, being a conservative is not a bad thing. It's great. It's a long tradition. Uh, you want to conserve things. But these are uh, in which are really far right uh, people. I mean, uh, not, not for mental health. Too. Yes, right, right. So, uh, and, and I think there's been a great reaction there. Now, re re recall elections are hard. They, they differ. The, the criteria differ from from state to state, locality to locality. Um, but I, but I think it, it again goes back to what Michael was saying at, at the beginning. Uh, when you got local officials, uh, you know the, the president's out there, the governor even, is, school board members and county commissioners and city commissioners aren't out there. They're right. You see them in the grocery store. Uh, and you know they. There is a reason that that, that those officials have to be responsive, and uh, yeah, I'm just staggered in Wichita by the arrogance of of, of, of these people. So I, I do think that at the local levels is where you really can have more of more of an impact because of this immediacy. Just remembering our history, I, if I'm not mistaken, um, this organization kind of came as a reaction to this. Uh, she'll correct me if I'm wrong, you know. Um, but, um, you know, conservatives in the 1970s, they really were very deliberate and intentional as they began to develop strategies to target these low turnout elections, school boards, uh, party primaries, especially in closed primary states, um, local elections. And so on and so forth. And there, it was a very intentional decision. This is a long term uh, plan. This is not something where we're going to win in two years. We're building a groundwork, we're building a base. Um, my best recollection of the history of the mainstream coalition is it was kind of formed as a response to this. And, hey, what are moderates doing over here? What, where is our organization? And that's, that's, that's my understanding because that's a little bit of your history and some of the folks that were, were spearheaded that. Um, and um, Anyway, bottom line, still going strong. Um, I just, I can't drive this point on home hard enough. Most Americans don't vote in these elections. We're looking at 20, 30% turnout. I don't pay any attention to turnout as a percentage of registered voters. I'm interested in turnout as a percentage of voting eligible. Uh, if they're not registered, why aren't they registered? They, uh, in theory, could be. We've thrown some roadblocks out. Um, and I have a whole tirade about that. I don't lay that on you right now. Uh, but, but, we have to look at the people that could have registered and chose not to as well. And when you when you look at turnout that way, it's it's just abysmally low. And I think that's where you get situations like Texas County. Is not that many people are paying attention. So those few that are, if they are organized, um, they can win. Was it wasn't it Nancy Olson that said a small but organized interest group can almost always get what it wants? And they're economists is widely read by political science. Um, and they're proving that that's true. Now, I, I, I guess uh, uh, about, a, about a month ago, I, I wrote about, uh, about, about elections and the idea that uh, in the face of Kobach and someone who's trying to restrict registration, one, one of the campaigns should be uh, to be small and be Democrats and uh, be as aggressive at uh, of registering everybody as possible. And the second thing that, that I feel very strongly about and would be a great change in the state of Kansas uh, is that if we had many, 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 many more uh, uh, vote by mail elections, uh, Oregon just voted 70% turnout vote by mail. Uh, you get 70% turnout even of registered voters. That is really, and, and it, it, again, a small in terms, not in terms of big D Democrat of politics or liberal or conservative, but just in terms of, of democracy, having seventy percent of the people vote is terrific, uh, and I think it would work better for the people in the, in, the, in the middle as well. We've got a couple of questions now uh, here on the cards about uh, the two senators you mentioned. 
and I'm sure there are others, uh, who suddenly sound more moderate or centrist. Is it just because it's an election year? Do you truly think they've seen the writing on the wall and they're becoming more moderate? Or do you think this is something to get through the next election? Well, since I just wrote about this, uh, I, I, no, I don't think so. I, 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 think, I think politicians always have elections in mind. Um, but I think they're two very, very different cases. Uh, Jim Denny is 59 years old. Uh, he is not a natural politician. Uh, he's very shy. Um, and uh, I'm a Facebook friend of his wife, Mara, and, and God love uh, Serious, seriously. Uh, but uh, Jim is, uh, he, I think, has an accountant slash CEO mentality. And so I think he sees the numbers and says, oh, this is not very good. Now, how that plays out in, in, in re-election for him, I don't know. Conversely, Jeff King is 40 years old, graduate of elite university, Yale Law School, uh, wants to be something. Uh, uh, governor, senator, house member, you name it. Uh, but a very ambitious guy, I think. And he's looking at his home and saying, you know, this is not working. Uh, other states, Republican governors, have made Medicaid work. Uh, I'm not a stupid person. Let's try to do this. And I think what both people are going to run up against is Sam Brownback being very, very difficult, if not impossible, to work with. Now, if that happens, then the question is, what happens to other similarly minded people in the legislature? And and I, I think that's uh, just a crapshoot right now. I think the, the big problem is that some of these people will say, okay, whatever we do, and, and Jeff King has talked in these terms a little bit, whatever we do, even if we pass legislation, Brownback will veto it, and we can't overcome a veto. Uh, just as I think the Republicans in the Congress ought to pass legislation and let Obama veto it, that's the way the thing's supposed to work. I think they should pass legislation and, 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 let, and let Brownback uh, veto it uh, to, to demonstrate that there really is disagreement, and that's what government's for. Uh, so we'll see. I was just reading a book I was teaching yesterday um, that there is sort of a folk wisdom in legislatures. Um, you all will like this. This is the right crowd for this. Um, that legislators become more moderate over time. That um, um, the, the way it was portrayed in the book, uh, this is a book. Um, it's portrayed very favorably. It's the idea that you come in and you're all fired up, and, and either we're going to make sure everybody has health insurance and so forth, or you're going to cut taxes or whatever. And then you see the realities, and then you start realizing, well, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Um, and, and it doesn't mean you necessarily completely forsake a political ideology. You start to see public policy isn't quite, quite as, as ideologically clean as you thought. Obviously, there's a cynical take on that, which is, no, you get co-opted by the system and the lobbyists start handing you cash and all at once you sell out. But but I, I don't know, I kind of like the more favorable view of that, that you, you start to realize you have to look at both sides to govern. Um, and maybe some of these senators are starting to look at it from the perspective of, instead of their ideology, the numbers don't add up. Um, and of course, there's a the whole issue of the home districts and the possible hospitals closing without Medicaid expansion. Um, the big variable then is the voters. Because <coughs> we've got the Tea Party now, and we've got this, you know, we made the word primary into a verb, primary my congressman, primary my state rep. And will the voters remove from office any Republican who departs?
And um, if you could just kind of keep us up to date or get us up to date on some of that. And it's been going on for a long time, I know, where they are and uh, you know what possibilities or outcomes we can look forward to this year. My, my guess is that there are any number of people in the room who may know more about this than, than I will. You know, I'm an academic professor. That's not going to stop me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I feel like I, I feel like we're in a Holiday Inn commercial. That you know, I stayed at the Holiday Inn Express last night, so I know. Uh, I, I, I did re just read a, a, a piece today, a couple pieces about about this, and there's a big hearing tomorrow uh, on on school finance, and uh, this is the thing that. Uh, I, you, you're going to have the Gannon case reheard again, and uh, we'll we'll see we'll see where where this where this goes. Um, the capacity to keep this going for quite a while is, is clearly there, but at some point, you you really are going to have uh, the Supreme Court ordering. Um, X amount of funding, I think, and the legislature and the governor are going to say no. And then, then what? What? What do you do? Uh, so, you know, I'm, I honestly am no expert on every in and out of this. But, but tomorrow, there's a new thing. You, you, you have, there's a court, and we'll we'll go from there. And we have no idea where that money's going to come. It's one money. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, I, I think that's well said. Um, and I don't have a lot to add. I don't know what you add money to because we have no formula. Um, and so um, that's actually, you know, it's one of these ironic things that, that as Bird pointed out, they really hate the courts. But sometimes when they do this kind of stuff, they actually delegate more authority to the courts because the courts end up stepping in to solve it. Um, by the way, right on your border here in Missouri, there is precedent for a judge ordering taxes to be raised to fund schools. Maybe that's on the agenda in Kansas now. I don't know, but in the, the two Jenkins cases, you're probably familiar with because it's the Kansas City area, um, they, the Supreme Court upheld that. Um, it may come to that. I, I guess that the only other thing I'd add is that um, it, it certainly implies that property taxes are going to are going to are going to be raised, and um, you know Johnson County has its own perspective on on that, although there's certainly limits. But for a lot of for a lot of uh, school districts, raising property taxes simply is not uh, an, an option. You could raise property taxes a lot. Far beyond the local option budget, it still didn't generate very much income. So uh, uh, this is—I I, I do think that again, where you get this friction, or the, where the, the the literal potholes are, or the figurative potholes are, that, that that's when you start seeing people really having problems. Thank you, and we uh, actually have a number of uh, legislators and people who are running for office in, in here and they'll be introduced a little bit later on so I'm, I'm thinking maybe one of these uh, have asked the question but it okay, so uh, they would like you to explain to the audience the dilemma that rank and file legislators have uh, when the House Speaker or the Senate President refuses to bring a bill up for a vote you know can you talk about how that process works and what can be done and why that is the way it is <laughs> uh, well, I mean, in some ways, it's always been this way that the the, the party leaders, are, uh, and particularly the speaker in the, uh, the House, the president, the Senate, in state legislatures, have a, a substantial amount of authority, as do committee chairs. But the, the, but really, the the, the, the uh, floor leaders have have the most, and they do have. Uh, substantial uh, authority here. And uh, I'll move it up to the federal level. Uh, 
to tell you that they gave you an example of this. So over the last several months, um, the Senate had passed the highway bill, the transportation bill, 300 and some odd billion dollars. And the House had not. Uh, and uh, Boehner had not brought it up. Uh, it was going to be very divisive, he thought. Uh, there were some people on the far right, Tim Hill's camp at all, uh, who uh, were upset that we were spending so much money on highways. Um, and Paul Ryan comes in, uh, opens, the, brings the highway bill up, has a large number of amendments, uh, not an unlimited number, but a large number, uh, some of which are attached, some of which are, you know, fail. Uh, he, he squashes some amendments. They won't bring up for one reason or another because he may think that the whole bill will fail. At the end of the day, uh, the highway bill passed uh, in a couple of different votes today. 360, 70 votes to 40 or 50 votes, maybe 80 in one of the votes. But basically, there was a huge majority in favor of uh, the highway bill. Uh, and um, Boehner procedurally had, had uh, not brought it up. Uh, Ryan did. I, I think when you went high marks, certainly among congressional scholars on Facebook today, we were all like, woo! Governing, hey, what's this? Uh, so uh, I, I do think that that gets back to the question of pressure on uh, that significant centers for, like King and Benning. Uh, can they pressure Weigel in the Senate or uh, Merrick in the House um, who um, and I, I, I just take Weigel because we talked about a couple of senators. Uh, uh, I disagree with Susan Weigel on, on almost everything, uh, but she's not crazy. And you know, I also think she sees her political career not attached to Sam Brownback, who, after all, is a lame duck uh, and pulling 18%. Uh, so uh, I, I think that. that one of the things about 2016, optimistically, is that the dynamics may be a be a, be a little a little a little different. The House, I'm not, I'm not so sure. I I just I, I don't understand the Kansas House. Uh, I can't say I understand the Kansas Senate that much better, but uh, I, I do think that dynamic is is different. And and, and senators in particular have had four years to go through this, and they didn't have to to go up for re-election in 2014, but they do have to in 2016. Um, so uh, you, you may have leadership being willing to uh, respond a little. And, and editorially, um, the one, one thing that's interesting, I think the Wango is a relatively strong president, not super strong, really. Um, but I, I think that I've never run I've never. Are there any press people here? <laughs> no, sir, I'm, I'm serious. Okay, I'll say it anyway. I've never understood Ray Merrick being speaker. Never. And somebody suggested to me that Ray Merrick for this house is a perfect speaker <laughs> because he's so weak. Uh, and, and, and the question is you know, could House members who were reality based? move him to, to, to address some of these issues. Uh, I, I, think it's, I, I think it's hard, but I don't think it's impossible. Because uh, I think that, that if you felt the caucus move, you might, you know, move that way. Thanks, and I'm going to combine a couple of issues that usually aren't combined, but I'm going to ask them this way. Um, a couple of questions about reproductive rights, and one of them suggests. How about those royals? Yeah, right. right. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's the reason I'm going to ask it this way. Um, I'm going to ask you do you think there's going to be an issue with those kinds of issues, reproductive rights, maybe more 
have them, they can do more with gun rights than maybe taking back some on campus. Are there those kind of issues, do you think, that they're going to come up and try to take the spotlight off the budget with some of those issues, either one of those, or are there other issues they might even use? Thanks, <laughs> Chris. The Royals really are awesome. <laughs> thank, thank you for coming tonight. Uh, um, um, well, we've been, um, I don't have to put in a plug here, we've been banding about a book that uh, Bird's the lead on, but both, uh, I and, and some of the others are going to be contributing to it. One of the things that's come up is, is I think this is partly is because we're political scientists. Um, we don't buy the Thomas Frank. Um, that uh, there's a political scientist named Larry Bartels who wrote a piece. It's on the internet. If, if, uh, you know, we're all nerds. You like this stuff, right? Uh, it's, it's free on the internet if you want to read it. It's called What's the Matter with What's the Matter with Kansas? <laughs> and, uh, and I actually was scheduled to do a talk one time. I had to cancel because my wife was ill, but um, it was called What's the Matter with What's the Matter with What's the Matter with Kansas? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, but essentially, um, the, the idea that the Republican base is, is uh, these would-be populists, these would-be 19th century populists, that empower the people, let's vote for Bernie Sanders, except that they're religious conservatives and they want to criminalize abortion and same-sex marriage, doesn't hold up. It, it doesn't hold up. And, and when you get right down to it, the Republican base is very conservative, specifically on economic issues. And especially, there's a lot of resentment there, this idea that people on public welfare um, and undocumented immigrants, and this is not true, by the way, but the belief that they are taking money from people that work and pay taxes. This, this is an economic conservative. So um, I guess my, part of my answer would be, um, I, I, just to say, I, I'm not in the Thomas Frank School. I don't think you hold up the shiny thing and say, oh, hey, let's pass, uh, let's pass another law that... Uh, uh, anyone in Planned Parenthood has to uh, stand on their head uh, for uh, three hours a day or they'll lose certification or whatever, whatever new way to harass them they can think of. Um, I don't buy it. I think the Republican base wants economic conservatives. I really do. Uh, particularly going after this perception that people on public welfare are taking advantage of them. Um, and again, I'm not endorsing that because I don't think that's true, but that is a perception. Um, and so in the sense of raising the issue for political capital, I, I'd say no. Uh, on the other hand, we have to remember that those who do want to criminalize abortion and such are true believers. And they mean it. Um, and those bills come up every session and they have a lot of votes. So I don't mean to suggest that the issue won't pop up. Um, but I, I do reject the shiny thing theory of politics. Yeah, you know, I, I just turning off what Michael just said. I think there are always issues, particularly on abortion, uh, in, that you can tighten the screws one more ratchet, whatever. Sam Brownback never has to mention that because, and I hear I disagree somewhat. I, I think you have these two strands of conservatism that somewhere in the late in the last five, seven years, came together. And I th actually think the social conservative, conservatism came first, and, and the fiscal conservatism joined it. Uh, and then certainly in the election of 2010, you cannot overestimate the importance of the election of 2010 uh, in changing the nature of many, many state legislatures and governorships, including Kansas. Uh, so I, as with Michael, I think these things are out there, they're on the agenda, Every year there'll be there'll be one more, one more. Uh, the 20, 20 weeks viability is is a, a big one right right now. Uh, they're all there, but there there are all kinds of, of, of those. Uh, I don't see them as as, as being used. Uh, I do agree to, to take the light off the, the fiscal uh, issues. I, I think the fiscal issues are, are so powerful right now that. Um, uh, and, and the social conservatives essentially won. Uh, as someone who teaches at a public university, and I walk in that door every day, and there's the, the, the picture of the gun with, you know, no, you know, with the line through it, uh, in 2017, that line is gone. 
and turns out I'm on phase retirement. Uh, <laughs> just happens. Uh, but but I mean I, you know I'm. What 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 would I do if the day I come into class and, and a kid walks into in, into the class with a gun? Uh, do I walk out? I, I'm in pain by the state. Uh, if if I'm in Dillon's and someone walks in with a gun, I'm going to tell the manager there's a person with a gun in here. I'm a loyal customer. I'm leaving. But you know, I really don't know. And, and I think. We've been put in situations that we could have never imagined 10 or 15 years ago. It's just staggering. My wife heard the guy today saying, oh, we spent too much on education. we got to spend more on prisons. She said, what did he say? In what world is he in? And I, I think that, that, uh, that I think we are coming going to come to terms with, with, some of the, with some of those as our funding declines, things like that. But uh, I think across the country, uh, we're going to have to we'll deal with the extent to which we have changed, as you were talking about. Um, my take on Hillary, just briefly, because I think this is all relevant at all times, is that uh, Hillary will be pilloried uh, in many ways, much like uh, Obama, it will not have the holding power uh, that, that the attacks on Obama have had, and that is 90% because of race. Uh, gender is something, okay, but race is so powerful in our society. And I think, you know, I, so I, I hold some hope that we move back a little bit uh, on, on the, on the gross and pathetic notion that Hillary Clinton is a white woman. <laughs> I hate to double dip, but just really quick, but on this guns on campus, to, to talk about the political piece, um, one thing that needs to be said is that the, the Republican Party is committing political suicide. Um, it's not right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, make it easier. But, um, you know, a lot of our students, a lot of Johnson County students go to KU and study with Bird, they head to K-State or what have you. Um, we get a few, but we get a lot of students from rural Kansas at Emporia State. We're a real draw. They're very comfortable with Emporia State. And um, their views are not aligned with Brownback or Obama uh, or Merrick or Wagle. Um, they've got a few issues. Um, God is very important to them, and I, I respect that. Um, but um, and, and not just faith, but some faith and politics issues. Um, but once you get past those few issues, they're basically liberal. Um, and, and I'm not even talking about KU, I'm talking about Emporia. And I think there's hey. some generational that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. And, and then, of course, the reality is the state and the country are becoming more diverse. The state's becoming more Latina. Um, and um, um, the, these uh, these older white folks, not all older white folks, but these older white folks that are going to go down shooting in the Republican Party, they're going to take the party with them. Um, they're going to leave the next generation with a mess. Um, but the reason I wanted to mention it, just real quick, and then I'll shut up, but the, uh, the student groups, the Associated Student Government, the, you know, the, the class president and all that at the schools, they have joined together and they're doing some polling on the um, guns on campus, and the students are dead set against it. And it's, it's not just those liberals at KU. I mean, they're against it at Hayes. They're against it at Emporia. Um, and that's just an example. One thing I will say about the current leadership of the state, they're, they're out of touch with the people that Bird mentioned earlier that are under 40. Okay, I'm going to read this one because it's about can care, and it's something that I'm not familiar with. So uh, it says, regarding can care, the administration is now planning to implement a global or integrated waiver that will include all waivers, IDD, TBI, Braille and Elderly, PD, et cetera. This is supposed to go into effect 2017, and it's a huge undertaking. What's your impression of this new directive? Do you think that's something that will go forward? Do um, you think it'll be a colossal failure? Do you think it'll just limp along, work? 
I just don't have the information to 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 to, 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 to deal with that. Uh, I, I I just I just I just don't know. I but I would say that in this administration, these are people who really do not care about governing. Uh, and so my initial reaction to any proposal is that they want less accountability, uh, that they do not want to uh, try to govern unless it's going to be to deny people benefits or, or shrink the, shrink the size, size of, of government. Um, so, I mean, my initial suspicion is that they, they simply don't want to govern. And honestly, sometimes, you know, I, I'm a big fan of the free market. I want the market to work. But there are instances in which the, gov the government needs to, to have a role. And, and sometimes, as with prisons, for example, um, there shouldn't be a private prison. If, if, if we're going to incarcerate people, the second most, the, 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 the most powerful thing a state can do is take your life. Uh, the second most powerful thing a state can do is to incarcerate you. And the state should be responsible for this incarceration. You shouldn't farm it out to private, private, <laughs> private companies. And, and the records here are so clear. And the lobbying for greater, longer sentences, or immigrants being incarcerated, uh, basically to benefit private prisons. So, so I, I don't know enough to talk to intelligently on that question, but, but I do have this, this suspicion that, that uh, this administration, the people in power, in both, both legislative chambers and the governor, uh, do not care about, about government uh, in any serious way. Isn't that a, essentially a libertarian philosophy that less government, more free enterprise, less interference, isn't that more libertarian than free market? I wish there was a philosophy there. I'm not sure it's a philosophy. I'm not honest. Okay. I'll give the coach a little more credit on that. I don't know. Okay. Um, this is one that's we would like to know about if you've got any suggestions. What's it going to take to get those who are actually registered to vote to get out and vote? I mean, I think in the last governor's election, I think about half the people voted. About half voted for Brownback and about half voted for Davis. The other half didn't vote. What's it going to take? Get yeah. words of wisdom for us. Michael's a political operative. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm just a thought. I'm just a father of a political operative. Yeah. <laughs> very, very low level uh, political operative. Uh, but uh, I think you got to start with fundamentals. Part of it's awareness. Um, I don't know if I'll ever forget the time I, I was teaching a legislative politics class during a midterm election year. It was, actually, it was 2010 is when it was. Um, and uh, I asked one of the students, I said, do you think your friends are going to vote in the midterms? And he said, my friends don't know that they are midterms. <laughs> uh, and then when you get into these local ones, like, again, going back to Sedgwick County, I mean, that's a monumentally important election, but not many people voted in it. Um, and, and so you've got to start with square one is just awareness. Are people even aware that elections are being held? No. Um, it's, it's a new world. Um, Millions of Americans don't have a news habit, um, and, and we get a lot of our content of news through social media, but we can also select what content we get through social media. And not only does that mean that liberals get liberal news and conservatives get conservative news, it also means apathetics get apolitical news. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I think part of it is uh, how do you just get the word out? Did you know there is an election today? Do you know what's on the ballot? Do you know what's at stake in this election? I think that'd be a good place to start. I don't know. I was uh, coming in, I was looking around, and I just looked behind me, and I, I, I saw the word rational. <laughs> all, all, all my alarm bells went off. Uh, uh, because I do think that we, we tend to think in, in rational. Uh, Terms uh, and uh, a lot of this may not be very rational, uh, 
But I'm not, I mean, I've got friends who, who do uh, uh, genetics and politics and, and, and how, how we're hardwired. Pretty interesting stuff, but I'm not going to go there. But uh, I mean, I'm going to go to where I have gone and I've been talking to mainstream coalitions pretty much since its uh, inception. Um, and, and that is to go back to the people who successfully do this in the state. And that's, th that is social and economic conservatives. Uh, and and uh, they do it through churches, they do it through uh, the, the, the uh, Republican Party, which the conservative right wing is pretty much totally captured. Um, they, and they take it very, very seriously. And they work very hard at it. Uh, had a woman from Topeka call up today uh, this afternoon. She started talking about uh, committee positions. And she said, did you know that, uh, that for both political parties, but particularly for the Democrats, that you can look down the roster and there are no political uh, committee people in precinct after precinct after precinct after precinct. Now you've had all those fights in Johnson County, and I'm sure you're very aware of that. Um, she said, what's going on here? And I said, well, this is nothing new. Uh, we, uh, uh, political scientists were looking at this in the 1960s. Um, but it really does start with those kinds of building blocks. And so a guy named Harold Lane is, re is retiring from the Kansas legislature from Topeka, and he ha he, his district incorporates any number of precincts. I think out of all those precincts, there are six committee people who have been elected. There should probably be 30 or 40. And, and they are going to start determining who the next uh, uh, house member is from that, from, that, from that district. So there's so many just basic building blocks. Uh, exercises that need to be done. And it simply may be getting five or seven people together and elect a committee um, precinct person. That's not much. So anyway, uh, if you want to look at a model in Kansas, there's a great model. And it's conservative Republicans who have done it in spades. Okay, one last question, and it's on Medicare. Um, do you think that there is a chance that uh, this year or next year that uh, the that Congress will allow the state this the state to be part of the com the compact and actually get that passed so that the state takes over Medicare? No. <laughs> um, I think it would be uh, disastrous if it was, and I think it would be very hard on. States, I think it would tank the Republican Party's poll numbers. Um, so I guess that's just a long winded way of saying. You know, I, there are so many times that there, there's this cute notion that we could do X and we could fix things. And I'll talk about two different One of them is the compact. That there are technically, is, you can do a, a congressional compact that doesn't require the president's signature. Uh, to change that would go into the courts, it would be, it'd be a total mess, and I don't think it would it would succeed. There's another um, a similar kind of proposal uh, called fair vote uh, that would be a compact among states that the uh, that would mean that these once it got to be you had a majority of states joining this compact, they would all agree that the winner of the popular vote, all the electoral votes from that state would go to the winner of the popular vote. Basically, it's an end run around the Constitution. I'm not a great fan of the Electoral College. I, I write a, a piece of about popular vote. But I, when you start getting cutesy procedurally, it, it's a really bad idea. And I've had big arguments with people on fair vote on this. Uh, uh, but uh, in, in the in the end, uh, and this is one of the problems, we have a system of, of, and it goes back to political science 101 of checks and balances. 
Um, and we have to work within that system. Now we can change certain things about it. Uh, what I see is at the national level, the checks and balances have gotten to be gridlocked uh, at, at, in about 20 or 25 red states. There are almost no checks and balances right now. And so we're getting the, the worst of both worlds in uh, both uh, the federal government and, and the state government in, 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 different, in different ways. And to go back to where we started, I think that you talk about compromise, and I think compromise is very important. But I would argue that even more important than compromise in legislative laws is deliberation actually having conversations, talking, and, and out of that could come compromise. What we don't have right now in the states or the federal government very much is, is deliberation. And that's what our system is, 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 is based on. Um, part of the compacts were a reaction to the ACA or Obamacare. Um, and I will give uh, right-wingers uh, I have to agree with him on one thing, it doesn't happen very often. Um, and uh, that was that part of what motivated that panic about the ACA, and of course it's called Obamacare and all that, but I'll call it the ACA, um, was this idea that once it's implemented, they won't be able to repeal it. I actually agree with them on that. Um, I, I understand their point that it is kind of a headless nail. Now, as someone that supports it, that's okay with me. But, but I do agree that it's, it's going to get kind of a Social Security-like, Medicare-like identity that it's going to be very difficult to pull out. I totally agree that the compact is very cutesy and not very feasible workaround. I, I don't see it happening either. But, but I do think that despite the fact that if you label it Obamacare, it holds very, very poorly. Um, and certainly it turns out the Republican base. The reality is, if you repeal it right now, you would take away health insurance from millions of people and dump them on hospitals, some of which are on the verge of going out of business anyway. Um, and that's one of the reasons why you have these Republican states uh, moving to expand Medica uh, Medicaid, even though it's counterintuitive. Is, is I do agree that now that it's here, good luck repealing it. And I think one of the reasons why such a comical idea has been forwarded is because no mainstream idea to repeal the ACA is going to go anywhere. It's, it's here, and we'll tweak it, we'll fool with it, we'll change the eligibility requirements, we'll fool with those exchanges a little bit, but it ain't going anywhere. Great. Thank you. Let's give him a hand. Okay, well, I just before you head out, I just want to make a couple quick notes and a couple of thank yous. Um, I want to thank our board chair, Cheryl Spaulding, for moderating tonight, and of course, our two guests for joining us for what's become an annual tradition. Thank you, Dr. Lemus, Dr. Smith. Um, I want to recognize our board and the program committee who put this on, and our, and our small but um, strong staff, uh, Lisa and Danny. And to those, we have some folks watching around the state. Thank you for joining us. This has been live streamed, but it's also will be online. So if you'd like to watch it again or share it with those friends or family members that could be here, they can go onto our website and watch this, uh, watch the show. Um, a couple of people I want to recognize. I love that we have so many um, legislators here. And what I love even more is that um, True to Mainstream Forum, we have Republican legislators and Democrat legislators here. So I just want to acknowledge them quickly. Uh, I know I saw Representative Boyer, and Representative Rooker, and Representative Owsley, and Representative Lusk, and Representative Gallagher. Did I miss anybody? I think I hit y'all. Um, and then we had some other uh, elected officials, um, Becky Fast with Roland Park City Council, and Kathy Brenth on the um, KCKCC Board of Trustees, Paula Schwach with Mayor Westman Hills. Uh, did I miss anybody? Go ahead and stand up if I did. So thank you for being here. Thank you for um, being so actively engaged in our community. And uh, in addition to those that have run and successfully won and now are representing us, um, now that we're already looking to 2016, the big question is um, you know, who else is going to run? So I'm hoping that some of you will be raising your hands. In the meantime, I know some of you already have and that we have some candidates in the room. And I just want to introduce quickly the candidates because 
without uh, people running, we don't have good people to work for and vote for and represent us. So if you could stand up quickly, and I'll just quickly introduce you. Okay, so I see Lisa Gable, who's running in the 14th district against Representative Keith Esau, and Dinah Sykes, who's running in the 21st district uh, Senate seat against Greg Smith, and um, Cindy Halter, who's running in the uh, 16th, uh, which is a representative of Amanda Grossman's seat. So thank you for running and for I also wanted to recognize the Prairie Village Post that was here earlier. I think Dan left, but for those of you that live in Northeast part of Johnson County, I feel we're so lucky to have such great coverage and that they are consistently doing reporting and coverage of, of uh, mainstream events. And finally, I want to thank uh, the Colonial Church who's continued to host these events. And for those of you that are uh, members here, uh, thank you. Thank you for having us. And just a couple of quick things. Uh, oh, and finally, we had a huge event last week. Some of you were there. Uh, it was our annual stand-up speak-out dinner. We had almost 600 people in the room. And, and it really felt like mainstream has grown from being a community of like-minded to part of a larger movement, a movement of people that are committed to turning around our state. And what excites me as much as last week's event is coming tonight and seeing so many of you who actually I don't think were at the dinner, but new faces. And so I love that it's bigger than just 600 people and it's bigger than the few thousand that follow us or get our emails. So I want to welcome the new faces that I see here. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, we are co-sponsoring tonight's event with True Blue Women. So if you're here with True Blue Women, Welcome. Um, if you're new to both organizations, welcome. And I also want to recognize a longtime partner, League of Women Voters, and uh, the work that they do with registering people to vote and getting out the vote. So um, to those partners, thank you. So of course, every event has to end with an ask. My ask is simply to come across the street and have another glass of wine. Oh wait, we did that. So we would love for you to join us to continue the conversation, but even more so, we say it mainstream, uh, vote, do more than vote. So this would be my challenge to all of you tonight is if you're not already a member of mainstream and or True Blue Women, join tonight. If joining isn't, if you can't join, make sure you're following both organizations. Um, we have you know, a legislative series. We'll do a series next uh, winter. Uh, we'll have four part legislative sessions. True Blue Women uh, is actually, I think, having an event in a couple of weeks. They're uh, rallying around the showing of the suffragists. I watched the suffragette. I watched the trailer. I, it was, I couldn't believe it. So, I mean, it's a great history of, to watch. And then the League of Women Voters is actually has a whole list of programs, but I wanted to bring one to attention. League meeting out on a limb, three branches of government. Mainstream is really advocating for a strong separation of powers. Our own board member, uh, Tim Owens, and Representative Melissa Rucker will be speaking. That's next Saturday, or this Saturday, the 7th, this, yeah, at uh, Home and Church. So, but back to the do more than vote. Um, join, follow us, and I think Bernadette said, you know, bring friends, bring your friends under 40. Everyone had a membership card on your seat. So I would invite you all to gift a membership to somebody you know. But even if it's not a membership, gift a being part of our network, which can be free. Sign a friend up to just receive the weekly emails because I think, and we've said this over and over, that the real challenge is encountering sort of this far right or sort of this extremist group, but it's countering the, uh, the numbers of people that are just under engaged and aren't voting, aren't following the issues. And I think we end up in a bit of an echo chamber where we think we're all following these issues and outrage, and, and that honestly is just not the case. And so if you could bring one person in, we would double, we'd, be, we'd have 100, 200 people that got more engaged this evening. So that'd be my challenge, my first challenge to you. And then the second is, there are three candidates running tonight introduce yourself to them because um, and to our incumbents that are fighting 
for us in Topeka because they can't do it without our support. So find a way to connect with them and to help them in their work. And make sure I didn't miss anything. I think that that's it. Thank you so much for being here. And I uh, look forward to seeing you at our next event.